Hello, and welcome to the first video in our series for Math 3303. This is the video, video 1, on the first six sections in Chapter 1, and it's got Popper 01 built right in. So now, in 1.1, we've got some work for you to do before we even start. Here's our classroom connections. I want you to consider a problem. If you have a square pool, so that means all the side lengths are the same. If you have a square pool with side lengths greater than or equal to one foot and a set of one foot by one foot tiles, how many tiles are needed to build a border around the pool? What is an equation for the number of tiles n when s is the side length of the pool? Now pause the video and spend a couple minutes doodling on this problem. How will you start working it, and what will you discover as you go along? See if you can come up with two formulas for n, two different formulas, or try to write the equation in two different ways. I'm going to continue with the video, but you should pause and spend a few minutes on this problem. Here's some white space for you to work on. Then we've got some follow-up questions for you to work on. Make a table and a graph for each equation you found above if you haven't already done so. Do the table and the graph indicate that your equations are equivalent? They should be. They should be however different they look. They should be equivalent equations coming up with the same range number for each domain. Is the relationship between the side length of the pool and the number of tiles linear, quadratic, exponential, or something else? Think about why you know this is true. Follow up question number three. Write an equation for now the area of the pool, A, in terms of the side length, S. Is the equation linear, quadratic, exponential, or something else? Now here's the kicker, and this is the one I want you to spend a few minutes on. What is the combined area of the pool and its border? And we'll use C for that. What is the combined area in terms of the side length S? Is the equation you wrote linear, quadratic, exponential, or something else? Pause the video, and here's some white space for you to do some work. Now, let's spend a minute in guided reflection on these classroom connections. This problem is very typical of those in a middle school classroom, and it is leading the students to think algebraically. In general, students pick one of two ways to attack this problem. They pick recursively or explicitly. Now here's recursive reasoning. If, when you were doing sketches, you noticed that each time you increased the length of the side by one foot, the number of tiles you needed went up by four, let's look at this. See, here, here's your pool. And here's your tiles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So if you have one square foot, you need 8 tiles. Now remember, this is square, so you can't go to 2 tiles. The next step up is 4 tiles, and then... When you draw this, and remember, don't count your pool tiles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So if you have four in your center, you have twelve all the way around, and that's 
8 plus 4. And if you do the same thing with 9 tiles, which is your next square pool up, you'll find that you need, for 9 tiles, you need 16, and 12 plus 4 is 16, see? And so with your reasoning, reasoning along, you would perhaps make a table this is the number on the interior and this is the border see 18 if i have 4 on the interior i needed 12 and if I have 9 in the interior, 12 plus 4 is 16. And then the next one up is going to be 16 on the interior. 16 plus 4 is 20. See, we're just adding 4 every time. And then 25 is the next square number, and that'll be 24 tiles. And so on. If the next one up is 36, and this will be 28 tiles, and so on. Now, there's some advantages to this. It's very easy, and it goes fairly intuitively. However, you always need to know the preceding number before you can get the next number of tiles. So if your side length is something huge, see, what if your side length 22, 147. That's a huge pool. And how many tiles do you need? Well, you can just run this up, see, and, and keep going. No, that will take forever. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's actually switch, start working with this a bit. Um, now, we started out with a sequence of how many tiles we need on the border. And that would be n. And we're going to subscript them. n1 was 8. n2 was 8 plus 4. n3 was 12 plus 4. n4 is 16 plus 4. And in general, any number is the preceding number, notice the subscript is n minus 1, the preceding number plus 4. This is called a recursive equation. So a rule that describes relationships between, now this is important, consecutive terms is called recursive. So n sub x is a term n sub x minus 1 is the preceding term, the one just before it in the line, and n sub x plus 1 is the next term. So we would say, here's our n sub n, and here's our n sub n minus 1, going back 1 from 3 to 2, and here's our index n plus 1 going forward from n3 to n4. So we have two variables in the expression. We have n, the actual value for which number we are, and x, the index value. So n is how many tiles, and x is where we are on the list. Now, let's, let's look at some additional facts. If I strip away the n and just use the index, I have 1, 8, the second number was 12, the third number was 16, the fourth number was 20, the fifth number was 24, and so on. So I've got point pairs. And you can graph these. Let's look at this graph. Now these two don't count. These are an artifact from the graphing program. But look at this. Do you see? within the boundaries of what a bad artist I am, those are linear. That's a line. And that's not at all obvious from the recursive formula. So 
this is a bit of analysis that gets us to realizing that recursive may not be all she wrote about analysis. There may be some more information in there, and we need to do more work. So what we've done, though, is we've set up a domain, which is the x values, and a range for this graph. The domain, which is the x values, is the set of counting numbers that we used as subscripts, the indices. And the range, the y values, are the number of tiles in the border. So that would be n sub x. Now, the big advantage of recursive reasoning is it's very intuitive, and it is the most natural way to reason for visual and kinesthetic learners. They do this on automatic pilot. So there's a teaching issue here. You have to take what they do normally and move them gently to a more er, uh, algebraic approach. So, but you need to know what they're doing in their minds. And I'll tell you what, recursive reasoning is really very common. Now, the next type of reasoning that more sophisticated students do is explicit reasoning. If you counted the tiles needed along each side and then added the four corner tiles, you maybe came up with an explicit equation. You need one tile for each foot of a side length, 4s, plus four corner tiles. n equals 4s plus 4. This is called an explicit equation, and it allows you to solve for n directly from the pool side. If the pool is 10 feet to a side, it's 4 times 10 plus 4 equals 44. So you don't need the preceding pool. You don't have to make a sequence list. Now, notice that these equations are equivalent. If you have n sub s, this is functional notation, equals 4s plus 4, oops, 4s plus 4, And n sub n equals n sub n minus 1 plus 4. Look at here. 1. 4 times 1 plus 4 equals 8. Well, that's the old 1, 8 that we had. 2. 4 times 2 plus 4 equals 12. 8 plus 12, yep, yep. 8, 8 plus 4, so I have 2, 12. These are exactly the same points. So the equations are equivalent. The third pool size has side length 3 and interior tiles 9. 4 times 3 is 12, plus 4 is 16. Yes, these two very different equations come up with exactly the same point pairs. Now, here's something. You need to participate on the discussion board. So here's our first discussion board problem. The first person... Um, to do this, the first person to get to the discussion board should name this page 8, Equivalent Equations. Start the thread with this. And what you should do is look on page 8. There are six equivalent equations. Pick one or two and come up with an explanation for how a student would have come up with that equation. Use correct two for squared, or write it out all the way, and um, let's have a discussion about what the thinking was behind coming up with those equivalent equations. Now, discussion board work is graded, so be sure that you do this. Now let's have a popper. This is also graded. You should be able to access the poppers through your courseware account. So here's popper question one. An equation for the combined area of 
of the pool and its border. Where C equals the area, the combined area, and S equals the side length. might be There you go, there's our first popper. All you have to do is go to courseware, select popper 01 under poppers, and uh, click on the letter of your answer. There's an electronic multiple choice form, EMCF, that will let you enter this answer. Note that these aren't up for the whole semester. They go down after the last video on chapter one. Now, let's spend a minute discussing why both of these equations are valuable. If you, as the teacher, asked a question like, how many tiles are needed if the pool is 11 feet square, you would expect your students, after this discussion, to grab the explicit equation. 4 times 11 plus 4 is 48. Now, if you then follow up with a question, and what about if it's 12? Hopefully, the students who have absorbed both equations would then quickly grab 48, add 4, and come up with 52. The students who did not absorb the information about the recursive equation would go back to the explicit equation and recalculate. So you'd need to visit with those students about applying, applying all the valuable information to solve problems, both equations. Let me note for you that there is a continuing problem throughout the text, the Farmer Jim problem. Please pay attention to that and study it. It's a very good problem and that they do a good job explaining it. Now I want to do a new problem. On page 11, problem 3, here's, a, here's the problem. A middle school cafeteria has small square tables where students can eat lunch in groups of four. So here's one table with four students. If six students want to eat lunch at the same table, they can push two square tables together and make a rectangular table. One, two, three, four, five, six. Larger groups can be handled by joining together more tables, but the lunchroom monitor makes them keep the tables in a straight line when they do this, so it's easy to separate them back and make the room tidy when they're done. So let's start with a table. Oops. All right. If I have one table, I can have four students. If I have two tables, I can have six students. If I have three tables. I can have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight students. Oh look, plus two, plus two. How about four students? I would say plus two is ten. And five tables plus two is twelve. Let's check five. See, so I put my tables Five. So I have five on this side, five on this side, one here, and one here. So that's 12. That's exactly right. And so six will be 14. So there's a nice table. Now, let's write the recursive formula, the recursive rule for describing the table joining pattern. The number of students with n tables 
equals the preceding number of students plus 2. So that was the plus 2 down the side. Now, write an explicit rule for joining the tables. Oh, the number of students is a function of x, the number of tables, and that'll be 2 times x plus 2. Notice on these patterns, here's three tables. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's the 2x plus the n's plus 2. So there's our explicit rule. Now, how many students can sit together if the table is 17 tables in a line? Let's write it out in functional notation. n of 17 equals 2 times 17 plus 2, which is 34 plus 2 equals 36. Now, here's a more interesting problem. In order to seat 51 students, what is the smallest number of square tables they could push together in a line? Let's look at this. OK, so I want to seat 51 students. So I look here. And I know I'm going to have two at the ends. So I'm going to um, say 51 students equals 2 times x plus 2. I'm going to subtract off those ends. And I'm going to get 49 students equals 2x. Oh, well, that's not go quite going to work, see? Because now if I solve for x, I get 2 goes into 49 24 times plus a half equals x. So I would say there's going to be 24 on this side. 24 on this side is going to be 48. See, 49, 50. So I need to add on another table here so I can put x at the end and then student number 51 right there. So I, I need 24 tables plus one more that I don't use completely. And so that'll be 25 tables. And then there'll be room for the teacher to join them. See, the teacher can go right there. Maybe that's not what the students want, though. Maybe they just want to be students. But in any event, you need 25 tables. So now, let's look at the bigger picture of what we're doing. We are playing with arithmetic sequences. We found some arithmetic sequences. Those were the point pairs. Sequences are functions, f of x's, with a domain of the natural numbers. Now, in the book, the author persists in calling this non-negative integers. That's natural numbers. Just learn to read that as natural numbers. So uh, range values are found by adding a fixed real number from a preceding term to the next term. The fixed real number is called d, the common difference. So here's another one. a1 is 5. So we would say this is 1, 5. a2 is 8. Uh, 2, 8. The index for the domain, the range value is the sequence value. Let's see, this is going to be plus 3. A3 is 11, and that's plus 3. Oh, we found our common difference, plus 3. So 3 is D. And we would say then the nth term is the preceding term, n minus 1, plus 3. So there's our recursive formula. Now, let's look at this one and say, what would be the explicit formula? Well, the explicit formula is y equals 3x plus 2. Mm -hmm. How did I get that? Well, I've got 1, 5, 
for point 1, and 2, 8 for point 2, and I'm going to say m, the slope, equals 8 minus 5 divided by 2 minus 1 equals 3 over 1 equals 3. Now, then I'm going to pick a point for x naught, y naught. And then I'm going to use the point slope formula. Now you can Google that if you don't remember this. You can Google point slope formula. Here's the point slope formula. y minus y naught equals m times the quantity x minus x naught. Now I'll fill it in. y minus 5 equals 3 times the quantity x minus 1. Let's distribute that 3. 3x three minus 3 y equals 3x minus 3 plus 5 equals 3x plus 2. So there's my explicit formula done strictly with algebra. So from this, we can start working on some facts. Each arithmetic sequence is a linear function with a domain restricted to the positive integers, the non-negative integers, the natural numbers. So every single arithmetic sequence is an f of x. Okay, they're linear. Also, we can write it as y equals mx plus b, where b is the y-intercept, and the m is d, the common difference. Let's look up here. You see that m is 3, and our common difference was 3. So once you've found the common difference, you've found your slope, which is pretty nice. Let's have popper question 2. This should be popper 01. That's the EMCF you're looking at, question 2. Given the following sequence, what is a sub 7? In the book, here's a quote. I pulled this straight from the book. Let's check it out. If f is an arithmetic sequence with a common difference d, then f is a linear function whose domain is the natural numbers. Is this true? Well, yes, it is. But let's check. So suppose I have f of 1 equals a1. So this would be... 1 is the domain value, a1 is the range value. f of 2 equals a1 plus d. This is 2a2, which is exactly what we've been doing. f of 3 equals the preceding one, f of 2 plus d, but f of 2 is a1 plus d plus d, which is a1 plus 2d. So this is... 3, a3, and a3 equals a1 plus 2d. Now, f of 4 is f of 3, the preceding 1, plus d. But that is equal to 
a1 plus 2d plus another d, which is a1 plus 3d. And f of 5 is a1 plus 4d. And f of 20 is a1 plus 19d. And here's the pattern. f of n is a1 plus n minus 1d. So look here, see, 3, 2d, 4, 3d, 5, 4d, 20, 19d. So this is n minus 1. f of n equals the first guy plus n minus 1d. That's the explicit formula. That's, that really works. That's the explicit formula. Now let's work with this last equation just a little bit. I'm going to repeat it. f of n equals a1 plus n minus 1d. Then I'm going to distribute the d, just like that, multiply it. So a1 equals nd minus d. Then I'm going to move the terms around. I'm going to reassociate. I'm going to put the nd in front. So f of n equals nd plus the quantity a1 minus d. I put a1 right there and nd right there. So let's look at this. f of n equals dn, because nd and dn are the same, plus a1 minus d. Ah, look, mx plus b. Now I've got it in slope-intercept form where n is the domain value, x. This is perfect. That is a linear form. So I've really got d is m. But I knew that from before. And then I've got a1 minus d is b. That's the new piece. Let's go back and look at that other equation, the one I started with. Here we go. a1 is 5, a2 is 8, a3 is 11, a4 is 14, an is an minus 1 plus 3. Let's get the explicit formula. OK, here's our new formula, f of n is dn plus a1 minus d. Let me fill that in. d is 3. 3 times n plus a1 is 5 minus 3 is d. 3n plus 2. Oh my gosh, that's the same formula. And look at how much less work it is. I mean, that's no work. I had to work. I had to get the slope and put it in slope-intercept form and subtract and do all kinds of things. This is just plug into the formula and let her rip. So this is very much simpler. We did all the work up here in the recursive formula, right up in here. This is where we did all the work. Now we've got a formula that's going to work every time. This is really nice. This is going to work every time for us. All right, let me get rid of that stray mark. OK, now let's summarize what we know about arithmetic sequences. A sequence f is an arithmetic sequence if and only if it's a linear function whose domain is the positive integers. So every linear function whose domain is the positive integers is a sequence, and every sequence is a linear function whose domain is the positive integers. Moreover, the common difference d from the sequence is the slope of the line defined by f. And b equals a1 minus d, the y-intercept. So let's go to work on another one. Here's another one. a1 is 11, a2 is 16, this is plus 5. 16 to 21 is plus 5. Oops, that should be a 26. This is a plus 5. So I know my d. d is 5. 
Now let's get the explicit formula. All right, so that's going to be f of n equals 5 times n plus 11 minus 5, 5 n plus 6. Perfect. There it is. We're all done. So if we wanted to say, what if somebody said, what's a sub 10? Well, I don't have to run this out to 10. I can just say 56, just like that. Substitute in a 10, 50 plus 6 is 56. Perfect. Now let's work another problem. Here's another problem. Let f be an arithmetic sequence where f of 3 equals 10 and f of 8 equals 25. Find the explicit formula using our new formula. Oh, well, hold on for a minute. I can't go from one to the next. I don't know what d is. So I'm going to fall back on uh, finding the slope by saying m equals d equals 25 minus 10 divide by 8 minus 3, so that's going to be 15 over 5, d equals 3. So that works. All right. Now, f of n equals d times n, 3n, plus a1 minus 3. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, the good news is, look, this is 3. So one thing to do is say 3, 10, and then go back. I know D is 3, so this will be 2, 7, that's 2, and then go back another one, that'll be 1, 4. Perfect, A1 is 4. Another way to do this is to say, okay, I know I've got 825 as a point pair. So I'll take this formula and I'll solve for a1. I'll say f of n is 25. 25 equals 3 times 8, which is n, plus a1 minus 3. Now notice, see, here's my y, here's my x. I'm ready to go do some arithmetic. Uh, let's see. That's going to be add 3 to both sides. 28 equals 24 plus a1. 28 minus 24 is 4 equals a1. Great. That's perfect. So my answer is f sub n equals 3n plus 1. There's my explicit formula. And notice I had to use some cleverness to, to get it, but it's gettable. Let's have another proper question. Here we go. Let's see. If I'm given an arithmetic sequence, and I've got f of 3 equals 13, and f of 6 equals 21, which of the following is the explicit formula? Okay, now let's look at another type of problem altogether. Here we go. Given the following arithmetic sequence, 
what is the n value for a sub n equals 52? So 52 is over here on the other side of some a sub n. It's one of these sequence elements, and I want to know n. So let's look at this. My f of n is my range value, and that'll be 52. 52 equals, let's see, d sub n plus a1 minus d. Oh, gee whiz. Okay, let's look over here. This is plus 5. This is plus 5. So d equals 5. 52 equals 5 times n plus a1 minus 5. All right, so if I go back, a1 equals 12 minus 5 is 7. So this is going to be 52 equals 5 times n plus 7 minus 5 equals 5n plus 2. Perfect. So, let's see. 50 equals 5n, and n equals 10. So, I would have had to go a ways. It's, it's easier to do the algebra. That's a new kind of problem. Okay, let's have another popper. Popper question 4. Given the following arithmetic sequence, What is the n for a sub n equals 51? Now we're all the way up to section 1.4. This is a classroom connection se sequence or uh, about a quadratic sequence. We haven't seen a quadratic sequence. This is, would be then not arithmetic, which is to say that the explicit formula is not linear. It's actually going to have a squared in it. So here's something for you to work on a little bit. Here's a typical question. After a sporting event, the opposing teams often line up and shake hands. To celebrate their victory, the members of the winning team may congratulate each other with a round of high fives. In this problem, you will explore the total number of handshakes or high fives that take place in several situations. You will consider three cases. Two teams have the same number of players. Two teams with different numbers of players shake hands. Members of the same team exchange high fives. So there's the problem. What we're going to look at is case three. Now there's one thing to remember. When two people shake hands, it is counted as one handshake, not two. There's two people, but only one handshake. So pause the video and start thinking about case three. What kinds of illustrations or tables might you need or be able to use? Will you be able to come up with both a recursive and an explicit formula, or just one of these? I'll give you a hint. It's both. So pause the video and take a minute to think about that. And then we'll have a popper. How can you tell if a sequence 
is arithmetic. Let's launch into a discussion about a quadratic sequence. If you're considering case three, I hope you actually, actually drew some pictures. So here's a question. How many high fives will take place among an academic quiz team with four members? Here's the way I would draw the picture. They would do one, two, three, four, five, six high fives. So we get four students, six high fives. How many high fives will take place among a golf team with 12 members? Boy, 12 is a lot. Let's hold on that for a minute. We're going to build up to 12. Write the equation for the number of high fives h that will take place among a team with n members. Yeah, let's build up to that too. Okay, so we need a table. Start with one person, zero handshakes. Two people, one handshake. So that's one, zero, two, one. Three people, three, three, four, six. We already did that one. Five. So we know we've got five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, let's see, nine, ten. I think that's got everybody. Yeah, five, ten. So there's a picture on that. Let's see, six people. Ooh. So we're going to have six that way. So there's six. And then let me number them. One, two, three, four, five, six. We'll have one, two, three more, and then we'll have one, two, three more, and then let's see, I come to three, and I'm only going to put in one, two, and then I get to four, and let's see who's missing. Uh, I've already got that one. Five, and then there was one, two, three, yep, yeah, plus one. So let's see, I've got six and six is twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I had five, ten, six, fifteen. I don't want to draw the picture. Let's see if we can see the pattern. From here to here is one, from here to here is two, from here to here is three. From here to here is 4. Oh, yes, I see the pattern. 5. So from here to here is going to be 6. So 7 will be 21. That's too many to draw. So uh, 
How do we know this is not arithmetic? Well, look at those differences. It's not constant. And furthermore, the, the name of the section is quadratic, so you know it's not linear. So that would about cover that. Let's look at a recursive formula. What would be a good recursive formula? So a uh, handshake for the number of people is going to be handshake for the preceding plus, let's see, not n, but n minus 1. Okay, there's my recursive formula. Now let's look at the explicit formula. This might be a little tough for middle schoolers. This would be something you would do with your the more advanced middle school kids. If you have n people in the room and each person shakes the hand of one other person in the room, you're going to have n minus 1 handshakes for each person to make. And since n people are doing this, there are n times n minus 1 handshakes being made. But remember our convention? This double counts. This counts like person 1 shaking person 2's hands. And then because we multiplied by n, it counts person 2 shaking person 1's hands. So we need to divide this by 2. So the number of handshakes is n times n minus 1 divided by 2, which is n squared, there's our quadratic, over 2 minus n over 2. That's the explicit formula. Let's check it with n equals 6. So that's going to be 6 times 5 divided by 2 equals 30. Divide by 2 is 15, and that's what we found when we counted. So now let's do that question that said 12. This will be, um, let's see, h sub 12 equals 144 over 2 minus 12 over 2 equals 72 minus 6 equals 66. Yeah, I really don't want to draw that picture. Now, let's take a digression and look at something else, something new. Here's another way to get that formula. Uh, this will involve a little math history. So I start with h1 plus 0. And h2 is h1 plus 1 is, oops, this should be an equals, equals 0. So 0 plus 1 equals 1. h3 is h2 plus 2. So that's 0 plus 1 plus 2. H4, let's drop off the 0, is 1 plus 2 plus 3. H5 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. You're adding n minus 1, so H5, we add 4. Hn is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus all the way up to n minus 1. This doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. Bear with me. There's a clever way to add these up. And this gets back into the math history. In the 18th century, as a punishment for acting out in class, the teacher assigned Gauss the job of adding up the first hundred natural numbers. He finished very quickly and got it right. Here's what he noticed. If you're going to add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus all the way up to 97, 98, 99, 100 and add them all, these two add to 101, and 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 so on, pairing them. Now, there's going to be 50 pairs, so all you do is multiply 50 times 101 to get the right answer. End of that assignment. Bright kid. So now let's look how we're going to use it. We notice that, see, we want to, we want to add up 
1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus dot 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 plus n minus 1. Now that's actually kind of tricky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch out the variables so you know I'm working this in the abstract. And I'm going to add to x. So I'm going to say 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus x minus 3, x minus 2, x minus 1, x. And I'm going to notice that these two add to x plus 1. And these two add to x plus 1. And all of them add to x plus 1. So there's going to be uh, x over 2 pairs. So h of x is x over 2 times x plus 1, which is x times x plus 1 over 2, which is not quite our formula. We wanted to go to n minus 1. So I'm going to use algebra now. I'm going to say if x equals n minus 1, my re desired last term, I can add 1 to each side and notice that x plus 1 equals n. So now I'm going to substitute. I've got x plus 1 is n, and x is n minus 1. Oh, and that's perfect. h of n is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Remember, multiplication commutes. So here's another discussion board problem. There are five problems two-thirds of the way down the page on page 20. Compare answers and help anybody having problems on the discussion board with these problems. Be sure to um, start the thread with the title page 20, five problems. Make sure you understand how to work all of them and help anybody who has any issues. Now, let's change topics. Sort of. We're still going to be talking about sequences. Here's another very famous sequence of numbers called triangular numbers. And these are very old. The Greeks knew about them before Christ was born. And they, of course, imputed all kinds of religious significance to the numbers. But we just look at them as a sequence with a really nice pattern. Here's dot diagrams. This is, will show you why they're called triangular numbers. You start with one, and then you add a row with two dots, and you can see the triangle. And then you add a row with three dots, and you can see the triangle. And then you add a row with four dots, and of course, you can see the triangle. And this is actually making a sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, let's see, uh, 3 plus 3 is 9, and then 4, and you would add 4 to get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. One, two, this would be not nine, six. Six. Six plus four is ten. And then you would say the fifth one plus five is fifteen. And the sixth one plus six is twenty-one. So... There's the sequence with its domain written as a function, but not a linear function. So here we go. Here it is written out, and we call them T for triangular. So the first triangular is 1. The second triangular is 3. The third triangular is 6, right here, 3, 6. The fourth triangular is 10. And the recursive formula, T sub n, equals the preceding t, t sub n minus 1, plus n. So there's the recursive formula. Now, the work we just did will tell you that 
the explicit formula is t sub n times equals n times n plus 1 over 2. That was the formula we just derived on the preceding page. n times n plus 1 over 2. That's the, that's the uh, explicit formula. So now, this is not arithmetic, of course. In the homework problem on this, I want you to interpret show to mean give two examples, not prove. So when you, I want you to figure out a way to demonstrate the, the statement, not prove it. Let's look at some similar examples. Here's some theorems about triangular numbers. This was uh, 100 AD. Plutarch did this one. If 8n plus 1 is a perfect square, then the integer n is a triangular number. Well, let's look at this. So, let's see. 8 times 1 plus 1 is 9. That's a perfect square. And 1 equals t1. Now, uh, let's see. 8 times 2 plus 1 equals 17. That's not a perfect square, and 2 is not a triangular number either. Uh, 8 times 3 plus 1 equals 25. Ah, and 3 equals t2. Indeed, look at that. There's two examples and one example that doesn't work because 2 is not a triangular number. So here's what I want you to do on your homework with those statements. Here's another one. Show that the sum of any two consecutive triangular numbers is a perfect square. Now this was again, Nicomachus was right about the time Plutarch was working, a hundred years before Christ. So let's pick two. Two consecutive, that means in order, T4, T5. Oh, yeah, 25. Look at that. It is. It's a perfect square. Let's look at why. Let me do the triangle. Here's T4. Now let me change ink colors. Let's see. So T5 is upside down in red ink, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And T4 is kind of slid over. Instead of being a triangle, it, it's more like a, it's not an equilateral triangle anymore. Uh, so here's 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. But look, can you see that's a 5 by 5 perfect square? Exactly right. Now here's something. Euler was working on triangular numbers, and he found this to be true. And I'm going to work this. I'm going to show an ex one example in each case for here. So if n is a triangular number, so are 9 times n plus 1, 25 times n plus 3, and 49n plus 6. So let me pick t3 equals 6. So well, let's look at 9 times 6 plus 1 equals 55. Well, now I need to show that 55 is a triangular number. I'm going to use guess and check. I know that my t sub n formula equals n times n plus 1 over 2. And I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to guess. And I'm a good guesser. 10 times 11 divided by 2 is 5 times 11 is 55. Yep, 55 equals t sub 10. Perfect. I, I knew I wanted something around 11. So that one worked out very nicely. 
Let's look at 25 times 6 plus 3. 25 times 6 plus 3 is 153. Uh, I need to work a little harder on this one. 153 equals n times n plus 1 over 2, and I'm solving for n. That'll give me uh, 306 equals n times n plus 1, and that's pretty close to 17 squared. It turns out this is 17 times 18. So that's a modified guess and check. So 153 is t sub 17. Now 49 times 6, boy, that's going to require some work. Let's look at this. 49, 6 plus, 49 times 6 plus 6, that equals 300. So I'm going to say 300 equals n times n plus 1 over 2, which gives me 600 equals n times n plus 1. And I'm not so good at guessing on that one because I don't know the perfect squares involved. So I'm going to actually use the quadratic formula. I'm going to say n equals Let's see, let's get this into quadratic formula form. This will be n squared plus n minus 600 equals 0. Okay, so negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divide by 2. n equals minus 1 plus or minus the square root of 2401 over 2. So this is going to be negative 1 plus or minus 49 over 2, which is going to be negative 50 over 2, which is negative 25, but we don't use negative numbers, so we know that's not the answer. This is going to be uh, 48 over 2, which is 24. So, yep, yep, this is uh, t sub 24. So I had to use different strategies depending on the size of the number. Okay, let's have another pop quiz. Question 6. 27 is a triangular number. True, false. Okay. Now, we've been dealing with sequences as infinite sequences, but let's look at finite, where there's just a certain number of set elements. If we restrict our domain to a finite list of natural numbers, like 1 through 10, then our sequence will not be infinite. It'll be a set with a given number of elements. If n is our end number, then our sequence will end with a sub n. If we had a d, and each term in our sequence is founding, found by adding d to the preceding sequence element, we have a finite arithmetic sequence. Here is a recursive finite sequence that is not arithmetic. t1 equals 3. Here's my domain restriction. This is how I know it's finite. I'm going to do 1 through 10. And here's my recursive formula. The next t equals 2 times the preceding t minus 1. So notice my indexing is slightly different here, but I still got n plus 1 minus 1 is n. So this is the preceding, this is the next. So t sub next is t 
So n plus 1 and t preceding is tn here. Let's calculate the second and third n's. t sub 2 equals 2 times t sub 1 minus 1 equals 2 times 3 minus 1 equals 4. t sub 3 equals 2 times t sub 2 minus 1 equals 2 times 3 equals 6. And if you do that, you get this sequence right here. And notice, it's finite. There's 10 elements right there. There's my sequence. These are the range elements. And if I want to make point pairs, I can. The domain elements are the indices. Write the point pairs and graph this sequence. So when you write the point pairs, see, you have 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 10. And we'll look at this. Let's see. The difference here is 1. The difference here is 2. The difference here is 4. Uh, 5, 18. The difference here is 8. Notice this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 squared, 2 cubed. Um, 18 plus 16 is 34. Yep, that's exactly right. So the differences are powers. So if you graph 1, 3, 2, 4, 3, 6, 4, 10, see, you've got this curve. And that's called an exponential function. So this is then an exponential finite sequence. I just wanted to give us a little practice in calculating some of these. Now, let's have another popper. The sequence starting with a1 equals 11 that has d equal to 5 and ends from 1 to 200,159 is a finite sequence. True or false? Okay, here's an application of our work on sequences to date. This is an applied problem. Find the number of multiples of 7 between 18 and 711. This sounds impossible, but let's look at what we know. First note that 3 times 7 is 21. So that's the next multiple of 7 closest to 18. And uh, 7 times 101 is 707, and that's right in there on this side of 11, 711. So that would be the largest multiple on our list. Now we can start at 21 and add 7, you know, to each term, but that's going to take a long time to get up to 707. So let's hold off for a minute. Let's go back to one version of the recursive formula. See, a sub 3 is 21 plus 2 times 7. And a sub 4 equals 21 plus 3 times 7. See, you've got n and n minus 1 here. So a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times 7. 
Now, I know that I can put in this information. 707 is the last multiple on my list. That equals 21 plus n minus 1 times 7. Distribute the 7 and combine some terms. So this would be 707 equals 21 minus 7 equals 7n. Subtract 21 and add 7 to get 693 equals 7n. n equals 99. So there's going to be 99 items on the list. That'll be perfect. That's the easy way to solve that problem. Here's another discussion board problem. Find the multiples of 8 between 35 and 1000. 635. Discuss how you proceeded. Start a new discussion thread called Multiples of 8. When you get to that. Here's proper question 8 out of 10. Proper question 8. Find this number. Find the number of multiples of 6 between 601 and 699. Okay. Now let's look at a theorem. Theorems are really handy. If we have a finite arithmetic sequence, and we need both things, it needs to end at n, and it needs to be arithmetic. If we have one, defined by a sub n equals a sub 1 plus n minus 1 times d, which they all are, then when you add up all the terms, here's the formula for the answer. The proof in the book is very thorough, and I, but I want to demonstrate this. Demonstrating proofs is a survival skill in this class. Let's demonstrate this proof. We cannot use this formula on anything but a finite arithmetic sequence, so we can't use it on the formula I, on the sequence I started with in this section. That one's not arithmetic. That was exponential. So this formula works only for both finite and arithmetic at the same time. Let's cook one up. If I've got a1 equals 3, a2 equals 7, A3 equals 11, my D is 4. A sub 10 equals 39, and I'm stopping at 10, so this is finite. Finite arithmetic. Our domain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so it's finite. D is 4. Our explicit formula is going to be, let's see, F sub n equals 4 times n plus 3 minus 4, 4n four minus 1. So there's that. What is the sum of all the range values? 3 plus 7 plus 10 plus all the way up to 39. I don't want to add that. Let's use our theorem. Here's the formula from our theorem. If you add them all up, it's n times a1 plus a sub n divided by 2. Let's fill this in. Let's see, n was 4, a sub 1 was 3, a sub 10 is 39, divide by 2. 
So that's going to be, uh, oh, that wouldn't be 4. That's, that would be 10. That's N, not D. N times A1 plus A1. Okay, so that's going to be 5 times, let's see, 42. So that's 210. Perfect. So, look how quickly that went. This is why theorems are wonderful. They really shortcut just a lot of work. So we really like theorems in this class. So let's finish up with two popper questions in a row, and then this video will be done. The sum of the first n triangular numbers is n times 1 plus t sub n divide by 2. A. True. By theorem 1.6.1. B. False. Triangular numbers are not arithmetic. Here's number nine. Here's our last popper for this video. F of x equals negative five x plus 47 is an arithmetic sequence. If we restrict our x's to the natural numbers, Okay, that wraps up our first video. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.